Good afternoon, everyone, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to our event today. And our event is focused on what's next for LGBTQI plus allyship. Um, can I remind people, if you are going to tweet today, can you please use the hashtag? So hashtag LGBTQI plus uh, allyship. So that would be great. Uh, thank you. So the purpose of today's session is to take an intersectional view of the challenges for the LGBTQI plus uh, community and examine areas of support that can be considered more widely in the workplace and in particular in society. So many strides have been made in terms of progress for the LGBTQI plus community in the past number of years. The biggest, of course, has been the outcome of the marriage equality referendum. But there also continues to be greater focus on allyship in the workplace. And there's been a rise in the number of LGBTQI plus employee resource groups who drive the activity, run events, and implement positive inclusive change uh, for colleagues. With many organizations supporting their employees with campaigns at certain times of the year, such as Pride, uh, which we know is really important for us to keep, keep on, on, on the map each year. But we also recognize, and in particular, what you're gonna hear about today is some of the work that, that is taking place uh, with the wider community. Uh, and, and that's really what we wanted to bring uh, to you today. So we need to consider what else organizations can do to provide support um, uh, out in and outside the workplace. And it's also important to consider effective actions that can build a sense of belonging for everyone. And we're delighted to have three guests today uh, to join our discussion who bring really interesting research perspectives and insights to this space. So the first person I'd like to introduce you to uh, and, and welcome is Dr. Tanya Niverleha, who is Assistant Professor in Law in the School of Law and Government here at, at DCU. Her research interrogates the interaction between the body and law and draws on human rights law, medical law, law and gender theory, and feminist uh, juiced prudence. She has advised government ministers, public representatives, civil and public servants, and many NGOs nationally and internationally on drafting of legislation and the development of public policy in relation to her area of interest. And in 2017, November 2017, Tanya was appointed to the Gender Recognition Act Review Group by Minister Regina Doherty. Tanya is the principal investigator on the IRC funded project, Lay and Professional Knowledge to Enable development of appropriate law and policy, and the DCU lead on the MSCA ITN project INIA Intersex, New Interdisciplinary Disciplinary Approaches funded by the European Commission. And then our next speaker is Dr. Mel Duffy, who is Assistant Professor in Sociology and Sexuality Studies in the School of Nursing, Psychotherapy and Community Health here at DCU. She teaches courses in sociology and sexuality studies at both undergraduate and graduate level. After completing her PhD in DCU in 2018, she has pursued an active research program in qualitative research with a particular focus on her hermeneutic phenomenology. Her work focuses on LGBTQI plus experiences of living their lives in the world they find themselves in, writing and presenting on lesbian health, and healthcare, coming out, relationships and sexuality, education, disability, identity, residential care and experiences of health outcomes. She holds a BA and an MA by research from the National University of Ireland, Maynooth, and a PhD from Dublin City University. Welcome, Mel. And our third panelist uh, today is Dermot McCarthy. So Dermot is a psychotherapist and an accredited member of the Irish Association for Counselling and Psychotherapy. He has over 20 years experience as an accountant and nearly 10 years experience both professionally and personally in relation to therapy. In 2018, he set up his own therapy practice, Inner Voice, which is now part of Under the Rainbow. Dermot is a practicing therapist and currently CFO for Under the Rainbow. In his role as therapist, he primarily deals in a variety of areas, including mental health, sexuality, and men's health. And in his spare time, he's a keen runner, and to date, he has completed four Dublin City Marathons. Uh, well done on that one, Dermot. Uh, he's a member of the Dublin Frontrunners AC, and he's an active member of Sporting Pride, which hopefully we'll be hearing some more about that today. And he's also treasurer for the committee. 
Sporting Pride's goal is to involve more LGBTQI plus participants in sport and thus improving the mental health fitness of the Irish LGBTQI plus community. So welcome all. I'm really looking forward to our discussion today and no doubt it's going to be lively. I may not get a word in again, so I'll, I'll make the most of it now. Um, and first now I'm going to hand you over to Dr. Tanya Niverla, who will set the scene for the LGBTQI plus community across the globe. And Tanya will talk about terminology and provide an overview of the challenges and barriers facing the intersex community. So thank you, Tanya. Thank you, Sandra, and thank you so much for the invitation um, to be here today and to be part of this event. Um, I'm, I'm really honoured. I'm trying to work out how to send a message. Ah, here we go, all panellists and attendees. So I've just plonked something there in the chat um, because often the first thing that people ask is what comes after the plus, right? And that alphabet soup that you have there um, that's come up on the, on the chat is the most recent thing I've seen in a formal document going to the UN that attempts to demystify what comes after the plus. And so in a way, this is, I've put it up myself now to remember to, to demystify it correctly, but it, there's a lot of different things going on here. So just to explain what all the letters stand for, it's lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, transgender, transsexual, transitioning, transvestite, intersex, queer, questioning, agender, asexual, aromantic, androgynous, non-binary, two-spirit, demi-semi-romantic. So <laughs> I'm huge sigh of relief that I got through all of that without missing one. Um, but it's a load of different things and they're all stuck together and lumped together as if each of these issues was almost interchangeable. And they're not. Um, what you have going on here are things that could be broken down into four different kinds of groups that really have nothing whatsoever to do with each other. So you've got questions here about sexuality. So to whom are you attracted? To whom are you attracted sexually? And to whom are you attracted romantically? And we can see in the literature in the last number of years that there's been a divergence in, in orientation and um, recognizing that you can have people who have very low sex drives who might have very highly evolved romantic drives and vice versa. Um, and so these things are not always the same. So that's orientation. There's also their questions of identity. Who are you deep within the marrow the, of your bones, the core of yourself? How do you identify? Do you identify as a man? Do you identify as a woman? Do you identify completely outside that binary paradigm? Or what is the label that you choose for yourself in how you identity, how you identify rather? There's also questions there about um, biology. So in what way is your body constructed? Are your sex characteristics such that they meet the definition of what it means to be a male person? Are they such that they you meet the definition of what it means to be a female person? Or do you have a mishmash of sex characteristics that mean that your body is physically intersex? So an intersex person is a person who's born with a body that the, the sex characteristics align atypically. And then the final thing that's covered in that alphabet soup is gender expression and gender expression is how we choose to express ourselves and that can have nothing to do with any of the three other things that we have just talked about. But in many ways, um, if we're talking about where people experience harassment, discrimination and disadvantageous uh, behaviours, it comes because someone reads a person's gender expression and either there's a mismatch in what they are reading and what they're expecting to read, or they've read one thing and then are shocked and appalled to discover that someone, um, that that's not the way someone would actually describe themselves. And so gender expression is where a lot of the actual difficulties and um, that reside in this space. What do these four things, gender identity, gender expression, biological sex and sexual orientation all have in common? The simple answer is nothing. But what they have in common is that they challenge our understanding of what it means to be a normal person in the world. Um, and so they challenge a heterosexual understanding of being and occupying space in the world. And that's the only thing that's similar about them. Um, and so talking to you today, if I can, for my last couple of minutes, I'd like to talk to you a bit about intersex people. So intersex is an umbrella word for a person 
whose body has atypical sex characteristics. So they may combine some traits that we would associate with males and some traits that we would associate with females, but either way, their bodies are built atypically. About 1.7% of the population, according to the UN, are, um, are intersex to some extent. Uh, language here is enormously contested and I could spend the rest of my time talking about uh, language and the, the arguments that people have linguistically in the space, but I'd rather instead talk to you very briefly about some of the issues relating to intersex, which may be why you're considering the I in LGBTI plus in the workplace, why we're here today. So why do you need to know about intersex from the perspective of being a person working in the world? Well, you want to probably know about it for two reasons. The first is to know that historic medical practice has been to intervene on perfectly healthy intersex bodies. So you can get the whole way to the autopsy table before someone realizes you are intersex. So it's not inherently life limiting or impairing of your health in any way. But in the 20th century, practices emerged in medicine to re-sculpt and recreate intersex bodies along more apparently male or female lines. The key here is that these were predominantly cosmetic interventions, not anything to do with preserving life. And then they were to be hidden and surrounded in secrecy. So when we look at how intersex people are in the world, there's sort of two stories of trauma going on, past trauma associated with what happened to them in the past um, and whatever might flow from that in the context of now impaired health um, need to access services and so on. And present trauma where people are still living with the impact that those earlier interventions have had on their bodies. From an employer's perspective, this may mean that someone has a difficulty holding down a full-time job. If uh, someone may need to, um, to access medical support on a relatively regular basis. You may be well able to hold down um, um, a full-time job, but you may have to go for quite intense operations every 18 months or two years um, or, or whatever, relatively regularly, which will necessitate six to eight weeks of being out of work at a time. Um, and so there are these kinds of questions about flexibility around um, sick leave and sick pay and so on that can arise um, for intersex people. The other reason uh, that I take this opportunity to tell you about it is nobody knows about intersex. Based on the last census, uh, the number of intersex people we have is roughly the equivalent to the number of people who were living in Carlo on the night or who were in Carlo on the night that the census was done. So that's a lot of people who are potentially intersex in Ireland and we know nothing about it. And every time a baby is born where there are clearly ambiguous genitalia, and that's only about one in 2000 cases, it's viewed as an emergency. And that's what justifies the medical interventions, which leads to this life of trauma that we've just touched on here today. So what I think would be wonderful is if everybody spoke to two people about what intersex is and said, do you know that this exists and that this is a thing? If you all found out a little bit about it by looking it up online and went for coffee virtually <laughs> with two people um, and while wearing your face cloth um, explained to them uh, what this was and if those two people told two people we would know more about it as a society as a culture we would be more accepting of intersex people the need for doing the surgeries would hopefully alleviate and that then would resolve some of the employment issues that can arise for intersex people um, and I'm sure there'll be loads of questions but I'll leave it there so that Mel and Dermot uh, can make their first statements thank you. Thank you, Tanya. And and you reminded me when you were going through your letters there of the, the gender bread uh, diagram you have, uh, which is absolutely fantastic. And I think um, if people could look that up or we might be maybe we could share it, because I think if it was something that you were going to bring back into the workplace to just kind of describe uh, what you had talked through, I think that would be a really good um a good visual, I think, to, to start with. It's um, been upgraded to the gender unicorn, but I, I find I, <laughs> I, I didn't the know chat. that. So maybe we can share the gender unicorn. Um, but just to say, I, I'm hoping, Tanya, that you, you made some really good points there around work flexibility and what's required. And, and I know um, and uh, was very appreciative of, appreciative of your support as we put this, our policies and practices in place within DCU. So we might be able to get, get to uh, cover off some more of that on the panel. Thank you, Tanya. So now I'm going to turn to Dr. Mel Duffy, who's going to take us through the barriers that exist for the LGBTQI plus community when it comes to healthcare and providing a next of kin. 
Um, and Mel will also take us through uh, the sense of isolation for many people in the older LGBTQI plus uh, community. And, and I know she has is very active in her research in this area. And can I just say, please feel free to submit any questions you might have for Tanya or for Mel or for Dermot. And um, hopefully I'll have time to put them to the panel then um, when we move to the panel discussion. So over to you, Mel. Thank you. You're on mute there. Now, there you go. Isn't everybody was delighted I was on mute. Telling me I have to unmute myself might be a bit of a challenge. Can I just say, when you actually asked me to do this and you had put in about older members, I wondered was it because of what had happened to COVID and I eventually had to abandon the fact of trying to look youthful and acknowledge my birth cert. So I thought, were you trying to say something to me and trying to get me to come to terms with it? So in that way, then, this is my coming to terms with my ageing self. Um, when you talk about invisibility, I actually want to link in with something that Tanya said, which I think is really important. For those who are heterosexual in the world, the one thing you never have to do is say, I am heterosexual. But for those of us who are not heterosexual, we spend our lives the first part of our lives, trying to figure out why we're different, trying to figure out why, you know, you, you have an aunt who comes along and says to you, or an uncle who comes along and says to you, have you got a boyfriend? And you're going, yeah, sure, I was playing with Paddy the other day. And like, yeah, okay, it was in the boxing ring and okay, he got floored and they couldn't count him out. So that's fine. But I wasn't meant to be playing with Paddy in that way. And people had a problem with me. And then as I got older, I kind of was wondering, what is the problem with me that Paddy wasn't somebody I was interested in? And it is that notion of how to come to yourself that has become hugely problematic for men and women who are different, who identify as being different within a society that doesn't allow us to be different. And we are constantly barraged by the heterosexual world and how the heterosexual world operates. So how do we fit? Well, education doesn't enable us. And, you know, we have now wonderfully within second level, the do pride week. But my thing is, why are we doing pride for one day? Why are we interested in wheeling out a diverse for one day or one week? And we're looking around and saying, look at, there you go. We've got queers, aren't we wonderful? No, you're not. You didn't know you had queers, not unless we tell you you have queers. But my problem is, that I'm not queer for a day or an hour or a minute. I'm queer from the moment of birth till hopefully they'll queer me into some kind of a grave or an urn, depending how people feel about me when I get to that end. And the problem is invisibility. Nobody knows who I am until I tell you. And that is the other problem, because why should I have to tell you? Why should I move into a space that's foreign to me, a space that alienates me, a space that silenced me. I know some people would find that very difficult to realize I can be silent, but I can be silent. I can be silent about what did I do for the weekend? Did you go to the film? Who did you take? Why did you take them? Can I tell you about, you know, myself? And it reminds me of, I did my PhD on lesbian health. I met this most wonderful woman in Ireland who was a nurse, absolutely incredible woman. She never uh, worked during the day. She worked night shift all the time. Why? Because she, and she not only worked night shift, she also worked as being the loose person who filled in. So she never got to know anybody. She never stayed in one ward for, this, for any period of time. She never had to say who she was. She said she was tired of listening to the young ones talking about getting married or meeting somebody. Getting, then they got married, so we're going to make it totally heterosexual normativity. They got married. Then they got pregnant. Then they had babies. Then the babies went to school. Then the babies uh, became teenagers. Then they, they started going to college. So now our heterosexual couple is beginning to, during that period, they put on extensions. They went on holiday. And she never felt part of it. And what she said she became was a good listener. Because a good listener invites conversations, but it's away from the self. And that's what happens in a workplace where you're alienated. Now, I know um, what uh, it was said earlier by Sandra, 
that May 2015 was meant to be a celebration. However, the following morning, we had this wonderful Vatican representative in Ireland turn around and saying it was a defeat for humanity. Therefore, we may have perceived to have had a little chink in the closet of acceptability from the heterosexual world, but we didn't. What we got was a slap in the face from the patriarchal society of the overarching belief system. We were unacceptable. We were not human because if it was a defeat for humanity, what am I? I'm not human. I don't belong to the human world. I'm another species. Well, I've always known I'm another species, so I'm quite happy being another species. But the problem is sometimes I like to feel I belong to the, to inverted commas, the, those who think that they're original species, because there's always this problem. Then of course, 2015, we had marriage. Oh, we're going to have babies. Oh crap, we're actually going to have babies and we're going to turn queers. So we're now going to have little queers growing up because we're going to make the queers. But oh, damn, I came from a straight relationship. My parents were straight. Well, at least I think they were straight, but they tell me they were straight. So I now have straight parents who made a queer. So now I'm a queer who's going to make queer kids. The problem is the little devils will turn out to be straight just to be different to me. You know, so if you think about it, this notion of somehow we are, the sky is falling in, the workplace will be damaged, the ways we have of talking will be disrupted. But hold on. When it was an all male space and the women came in, damn, we couldn't talk about their butts, we couldn't talk about their tits, we couldn't talk about the way they walked, we couldn't do all of this because now the women were disrupting male language. Now the women are now part and parcel, well, we think we are, of the work world. So now we're going to have the queers. We can't make jokes about the queers. How can we talk about the bent, you know, cistern in the toilets? How can we talk about this? if we have the bent already in amongst us. So now they're going to change our language. Now they're going to ask us to use language that includes us. And constantly when difference appears in the workplace, it causes disruption because we don't want to change. We don't want to accept, and we would prefer to talk about them, to make rumors about them, to have the stereotypes, to have the labels, to have the laugh, to have the jokes, to have all of this, and what we're asking for is just recognize you have no idea of the person standing beside them, what their history is, who they are, until you ask, who are you? The most fundamental question for any human being is to answer, who am I? And that's the problem for me living in a heterosexual world because I do it every day with who I meet but the heterosexual never has to do it until something challenges them to ask who they are. And that may be an accident, an illness, which transforms their way of being, which may transform them from being abled body to being a dis dash abled body, because society is for ableness. It's not for disabledness. But in the heterosexual world, you only meet difference when you yourself is transformed sometimes through the body to being different except it's a, for us it's a way of thinking it's a way of being it's a normalization of who we are and to come to terms with us means that we are not demanding you to like us because god help you all if you all had to like me to be something really wrong in the world and there's times i'm not likable i'm very happy not being likable at times because that actually keeps people away you know people give out about covid and not being at work you know, my inner hermit has been satisfied. It's absolutely thrilled. I don't have to talk to anybody. I may have to talk to who I live with in the morning. Well, like, I mean, that's damage limitation. But you have to put up with the world. Now, put me in the world where I am interacting, where I am talking, where I go to buy clothes, where I whatever. You know, there was a great piece of work done in DCU on you know, young people and homosexuality and gays in second level, but it was done about what would you think if you were queer perspective? So they asked the straights what they thought. And I loved it because what it was, was it said, they all loved gay boys. The women did anyway, the young girls. Why? They were great shoppers. That says a lot about the lesbians. Of course, we, our wardrobes are functional. They're made to live. They're not made to impress. And that's the difference. 
They, and if you think about it, the, one of my nag bearers is we have gay men telling straight women how to dress. And I actually find that offensive because that is patriarchy in another way. It's homonormativity through patriarchy telling straight women how to behave, how to be and how to dress. And that is buying into a system from my perspective, which is wrong, which means then when we come back to the workplace, we shouldn't have pride just for one day. The workplace should be diverse and inclusive, irrespective of who I am, irrespective of the person with knowing that I belong. How do I know that I belong? There are no rumors. There are no labeling. There are no jokes that are offensive, irrespective of my ability to be in this world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mel. Um, and and I, hopefully on the panel, we will come back um, to, to something you talked about there, which is language. And, and I think it, it does follow through, I suppose, exactly mm. from what Tanya was saying. Um, and, and I think that that's an important part of the work that needs to be done is that normalization of the language and kind of getting it out on the table there. So it's not avoided. I, certainly in the work, <laughs> in my work, in all the aspects of diversity and inclusion, it, the biggest challenge is the language, is how can we create the narrative and, and create a space where people can become curious and respectfully engage and ask the questions that they need to, to be informed. And once they're informed, it means then they can start to engage with the topic and I suppose broaden their thinking. So language is absolutely critically, critically important. So I'm glad now that both of you have brought that up because we will we will come back to it. Uh, and thanks for that, Mel. So now, uh, Dermot, um, welcome. And, well, and thank you. Uh, I, I, we officially uh, will start the panel now. Please feel free to submit any questions you might have. Don't be shy. I don't see any questions in yet. Um, uh, please submit the questions and definitely I will have the opportunity to put them to the panel. So Dermot, um, we've heard some really interesting and, and very powerful uh, insights from Mel and Tanya. And I, I just from your own perspective, I suppose, how does this resonate with the work that you're doing and, in, and, and the team, not just yourself, I know, but the team in Under the yes. Rainbow? Uh, absolutely. First of all, I love the passion from both my fellow panelists because we in Under the Rainbow are equally as passionate, passionate about it. Um, because I was just taking notes, little bullet points, and yes, yes, yes. So that focus first on the rainbow, on the therapy side, even yesterday, I took a call from a gentleman way down in the country and was fearful of his life because he was afraid that he was trans, you know. And just to have a call from somebody, he took a call from me, I was listening to him, I said, Said, oh, I'm ashamed of this. This is awful. The lads will slag me. The lads will put me down. And I said, it's not shameful. It is not shameful. It is you. So I asked him, how did you feel when I heard that, when I said that back to you? And he said, I feel empowered. I feel really thank you so much. And I sent him the information. You're more than welcome to contact us. Um, but I sent information to a therapy centre down in uh, Cork. We, they touched, yes, marriage equality was brilliant in this country. Absolutely brilliant. I never forget the day. I will never, ever forget that day. But sadly, the work has only begun. We touched intersex as well. We touched on the LGBT community, on the aspects of the LGBT plus community, because there's still a lot of fear, a lot of shame, a lot of fear of losing my job, will I be accepted, fear of rejection. There's still a lot going on in the LGBT plus community, or even I've taken the word back queer, queer community. So on the therapy side, we are really working on that. We've got a great team. Um, we've got an excellent student therapists who joined as well. Our team's getting bigger and demand is out there for it. So we're definitely seeing that. It's the invisibility. It's the fear that people have. So they can come to us and talk about it. We in Under Rainbow have to have an advantage because we all, most of us come from the queer community. I am an openly gay man. I've come from the corporate world, so I know exactly what it's like, you know. So I have that. On the talk side, on the workshops that we do in Under Rainbow, you mentioned language, and that is absolutely key. Language is, there's maybe a sense of confusion here at the moment. People are confused about, what will I ask? What name? What's that? Will I harm somebody? Will, like, I remember our first talk we did, and I'll never forget the question. The question is, I'm a heterosexual man. Will you be okay for me to go to Pride? And I went, I was taken aback by that. I said, of course you do, absolutely. Because like you're more than welcome to come and open and but well, I'm afraid that I might be it's your day. 
And I went, well, it's a day of celebration, absolutely, but we welcome everybody to celebrate with us. Mel touched on pride being just for one day. It's not for one day anymore. It's for a year. And we help companies, particularly EOGs who have set up. I was delighted, it was in my last corporate I was in, it was an EOG set up, and it was a pleasure to be part of it. My colleague Philip has set up and still serving PRA, got a lot of involvement from management buy-in. Um, and, and, and she mentioned to me that the majority of the people in the committee were not from the queer community, were allies, which is fantastic. This is what we want to hear. It's brilliant. So we are here under the rainbow. We have a wealth of experience from the corporate background and the civil service background. We know what it's like to be in the queer community. We know what it's like to be on the outside. So we urge people out there listening, if they need any support, if you're in the EOG saying, no, we're there to provide a service for you because we know what it's like to be on the outside. We will help management, help them to understand. But having this, this is great to be part of it. Because again, I'm passionate and I, I'm passionate about this that it's open discussion that we're having here right now. This is what needs to be done, absolutely. And again, I would say that on the rainbow, we feel we're in between, we're the, we're the it's people who the management may be afraid of these questions to ask and the employees who are afraid to come out. So we can help companies, help your employees to come out, be who they are, help you understand who they are, and just companies will get a benefit. I used to be an accountant, so I have the finance background. There's a great business case for this. <laughs> you know, if you look after your queer community, if you look after your queer employees, you will reap benefits. And don't just, what do we say, Sandra, I first met you, don't get a bus for pride and here we go. <laughs> yeah, great, brilliant, yay, you're brilliant. That's not. We've, um, <laughs> we in the queer community have woken up to that. You know, thank you very much for doing that, brilliant. Thank you very much for doing that for the one day. But what will you do for the rest of the year for us? Mm. You know, what will you do for the rest of the year? Because it's still not easy to come out. It's yeah. still difficult to accept who you are. Mel mentioned banter. Banter. Watch your banter. Watch your language. You don't remember when I was in the last one of the corporates I was working with? Your revision is a big thing for the gay community. Mm. You know, and it really is a big thing for everybody now. I'm finding because people in diverse background. But to the grading slagging that was going on, slagging yeah. of the contestants, mm. you know, and it was great for me to have an ally on my right hand side. She was a Canadian girl who grew up. Um, she asked me, Darren, what's the big deal about being gay? What's the big deal? Because her parents had gay friends and everything else. But it was great for me back then when you to look at her and she looked at me and went, like, you know, just let them off. You know, yeah, yeah. So we're seeing this in under rain, but we're seeing this a lot. As I said, we this is it's a lot of work still needs to be done, but definitely we have in the therapy center absolutely support networks out there, and also we're helping um your G's and companies to understand and help them to appreciate their staff. Yeah, and you feel identifying. And and I, I and I think add, that yeah, sorry, sorry Mel, add go ahead. That, yeah, uh, you know, you reminded me of something. Uh, when, when you were talking about the corporate world and, and the healthcare, I remember in about 2016, 2017, I went in for a, pre a procedure in a local hospital. Their system was straight. So we had marriage equality. We also had civil partnership. And I had been civilly partnered by that stage and I hadn't, we hadn't decided to do the marriage before that. But, so they asked you, what's your name? What's your marital status? Uh, who's the person? This is the Mexican. Who's the person? So I named her. Yes. No, it has to be a man or it has to be a whatever. <laughs> the system couldn't, or we were married to that stage, so the system couldn't hack two women. And I turned around to her and I said, you know, the, the banter coming back, and I says, look, yeah. I'm really sorry if your computer is straight. <laughs> you know, I mean, could we have, and then that's where I use bent and all this and the queer and the whole lot, and I use the language just of yes. whatever. And the problem was she was embarrassed. Because she, yeah. it, this is what you do. And not knowing how to face somebody who doesn't belong to your world, but you need to care for them. Yes. And that's exactly. the problem. That yeah. is the problem. Because yeah. it is, you may be the receptionist on your company. So you may get somebody very flamboyant coming in the door. You can't turn around and say, hey, do you hear, see your man? You... Professionalism means we treat each other as equals. 
Yes. We see each other. And to me, it's the scene. Yes. You know, and not making assumptions about the scene. You know, boys don't wear pink, but thank God for Toulouse. They, their stripe is pink, you know. <laughs> so I remember, you know, buying, we happen to have two boys, buying one of the boys a pink shirt, and he went, I'm not wearing pink. And I said, so Brand, meet you at the TV on Saturday. Sat him down. And I said, do you think they're not boys? Well, I'll wear the shirt. Okay, boom. And yeah. went off. It's this notion of yes. colours, what belongs to whatever. Like my dad was brown and black. That, because that's why he grew up with. There was no colour for men. Yeah. Now yeah. there's colours. Sorry. Yeah. Your grand, so, and just, just picking up on something you said there, um, Mel, and, and, and I suppose it leads into what you were saying as well, Dermot, around you know and and taking it into the workplace and about the system yeah. being straight uh, like i yeah. i remember a young a, a grad coming to me at one point in one of the companies i worked in to say that uh, he wasn't he had to draw boxes on the forms because he couldn't describe himself on the forms of you know of his partner yeah. and things like that yeah. and and i see that there's a question in the chat around where do you start you know what's the starting point and I think there's two key things I think that have come out. One is the language. So that educational piece, Absolutely. you know, Absolutely. creating spaces for people to ask the awkward questions that they don't yes. want to ask but, yes. and, and, ta and be, have an empathy and, and allowing yes. people to, you know, meeting them where they're at and allowing people to explore things themselves. But the second thing is that, that, that getting the house in order, right? The straight computer, the straight policies, the systems and that. Um, yes. Tanya, I might go to you on that because I know you, you've done a lot of work with um, organizations in this space. And and, and, and as I said, you've certainly worked with us in DCU and been a fantastic guidance for us as, a, as an employer in a university. But from your perspective, you know, where's the start? That's, that's, what, that, that's what some of the questions are coming in and, and are asking us. Well, I suppose there's a number of different ways to start, Sandra, depending on what it is you, you want to tackle first. Um, look, the forms are, should be a relatively easy thing. Um, we tell the computer how to be smart. So reprogramming, like any big company has someone in there who can do IT stuff. Um, and so reprogramming computers to stick in extra boxes um, should be a relatively easy thing. I mean, I'm seeing it coming on surveys more and more now. You know, the, the gender question is, are you Ma, you know, male, actually, it's a sex question. It's not a gender question because people are using the words male and female and not man and woman. Are you yeah. um, male, female, other prefer not to say? And those four options are kind of, I'm seeing them very regularly. There's a load of surveys going around about COVID at the moment. And I keep seeing those questions at the top of them. So including those kinds of boxes when you're doing your demographic um information grabs and then not putting that demographic information front and center on people's ids yeah. right so a lovely change happened when we moved from the paper driving license to the plastic credit card side yeah. one which yeah. is the gender marker the mrf disappeared That's off right. the 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 card yeah. now it's still collected as demographic information in the background but it's not put forward anymore because it's not relevant to how you engage with the state uh, one way or the other. So if you're collecting the information, keep it rear of house and don't put it front of house. So don't put that kind of information on people's ID cards um, and, and leave the space for people to be able to use the words that are that best describe them. And as a consensus emerges in the world as to what a third category should be and language settles down on that, then maybe it become the norm that that would be included. But I think an other box or prefer not to say is always a good idea to have. Um, but 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 but, but mm -hmm. once you have other, you're othering me. Why not have no male, no female, and ask the question: How would you describe yourself? That's a good, th and then have someone at the input stage can put in what's yes. in. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. I, I, I agree. Way, yeah. Mel, I absolutely agree with that because I got that experience um, working mm. as a therapist, you know, and I had a trans client who actually challenged me about the option. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. and I just yeah. went, well, and sure, I'm at a stage, you know, take it out altogether. 
you know, I yeah. was actually, why do I have gender? Like, just take it out altogether. Yeah. You know, yeah. but it's it's it, it's just to recognize that there is individuals out there who don't, yeah. want to be put into yeah. boxes. you know, none of us do yeah. actually, it doesn't matter who you are, yeah. you know, none of yeah. us want to be put into yeah. boxes. Yeah, and I think that that's the challenge all the time is none of us want to be put in boxes, no. but then if you're not... If, you're, if we don't know that people are there, we can't support them and you're not counted. And it's yeah. the same for every aspect of DNI, isn't it? Like, yeah. it's okay. not, but that's, yeah. I think, uh, in, in, in a way, you've actually drawn me to the very first point I was going to make on my, 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 my next little bit, which yeah. is know your privilege, right? So you guys just called me out on the fact that I don't have to worry about these boxes. So, you know, that that's my privilege and being aware of that. And, you know, this is an event about allyship. So how can you be a good ally? I mean, it's a yes. different, an event on how do you make structures work within a corporation? That's a different event. But this one is about allyship. So yes. how, how are you a good ally? And I would but, say- that but If you come back to it, Tanya, you're right. But if you come back to it, if I don't know, how will I, how will I help you? But the fact is, you will help me by not having to ask. And yeah. not having to know, because if you work from inclusiveness and diversity, I don't have to come out. I can yeah. choose. I can stay yes. wherever I want. But yeah. if I have to tell you and then you meet my needs, that's no good. Because that's yeah. telling me I'm going to yeah. do differently. Yeah. yeah, which kind of addresses the question Margot had there in the chat about how do you deal with this in parts of the world where it's yeah. illegal to... Yeah. To have yeah. a non-straight identity um, and it's make these things unimportant you know I, I think Margaret Mar you have to learn from Irish society don't forget until 1990 all of us who were lesbian or gay were under the rubric of a need of mental health intervention quite a number of us successfully skated that into not getting a medical definition of who we were. Because if our parents knew, it would have had completely and utterly, I wouldn't be sitting here today because I would never have had the opportunities in life I had if I had not stayed in the closet, only informed a few people. So we also was a world where it was both uh, criminal, it was pathological, it was a sin, it was all of those things. So those of my age group and older lived with that, know it. Our problem is, and I always jokingly, and Tanya, you know I do this. I jokingly talk about I have trust issues. It's not a joke. I actually do have trust issues because I have no idea who I can tell what to and it's going to be safe. That's the problem. And Mel, can, do you mind if I bring you back just to something we were talking about actually before, before we started the webinar and a question has come up about it, which is around using pronouns. Um, oh. Do you mind just while I, while I have you there, um, yeah. just to, because I think it does like, again, a very practical thing um, yeah. and, and something we need to consider in our workplace. Do you mind just from your perspective? And I, I might ask Tanya then as well. To come from in my on perspective, yeah, I... I I've taken the position of not, not using them simply because if I, if I'm a, one of my fears is that if I use pronouns and I work in education and I have students and I have those because of programs I run who may be interested in taking my program. So if I use a pronoun, what am I saying? I, to some people I'm saying inclusivity, to other people I'm saying exclusion. So I would prefer people to feel that they can come and through talking to me, they may then ask if they wish. But I also want to be open to allow people who may have and may feel that they can't go there, they can't ask the question because they may have ideas about what it means, rightly or wrongly, to have them your pronouns right there and center. So I've chosen not to, in, uh, to allow those who may feel it's exclusionary to come forward and I am out and open in the workplace so therefore they they should th those who use them I'm hoping will feel inclusion because and ironically Mel that's why I use them yeah no, no, <laughs> because no, I'm a straight that. cis person yeah um and so yeah. 
you know, my story is that I'm one of those normal, ordinary people who's oppressing everybody, right? But the problem is, though, Tanya, you think you're normal. Yeah. Well, that is true. I think I'm normal. I'm, yeah. I'm operating on the assumption. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. But I and I don't normally have them on my uh, Zoom, actually. I only put them on that today um, because we were having the chat. But I do have them hidden in the bottom of my email. Um, mm. And I have... I also have the Masquega, um, and oh. so that people know that they can, I, I do it so someone knows mm. to come and talk to me. And so students do come and talk to me mm. about these things because they feel I'm approachable. I put them there, Asquilga, as well, because if someone wants, despite my surname, um, which is just an accident of a birth cert and um, a father with a particular notion of how one should be in the world, um, it means that people can come and talk to me in Irish, which has resulted in mad things like my Quebecois francophone friend who will only speak to me, Asquilga, which is a nightmare when it comes to emailing and I'm worried about my grammar. Um, but it's one of those things to kind of say I'm approachable if you want to talk about this. Yeah, that's yeah. the message I try to send out. Yeah. 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 And I think and, and I think that there are two very great perspectives, you know, and, and again, talking yeah. about allyship, it's a great example and, and something that's definitely worth considering from from an allyship perspective. Absolutely. Tanya, just while I have you there, can I just a, a question? Um, and, and something we wanted to get your perspective on, you know, what would you say to managers who are planning the events around the Pride Month, you know, but want to make it authentic, inclusive um, for the broader, you know, the LGBTQI plus community? And, and I know um, you have a, a conference coming up that, that you wanted to talk about. So just you might give us <laughs> Let's uh, do a two few for minutes one. about that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in relation to events and wanting to, to celebrate Pride and show that you're inclusive, um, make sure you're asking people in a community what it is that they want so that everything that happens at a corporate level is inclusive and reflective of the wants and needs of the people in your corporation who are part of that community so um nothing about mm -hmm. us without us you know that should be your mantra um doesn't say that you have to have like the token gay person leading it whoever's on the committee is on the committee but that you have people who are in that community who are feeding in to the committee and informing the committee. So the committee are coming up with suggestions that aren't copying what other corporations did last year or the year before, but is actually reflective of what members of the community want. Yeah. Um, so like we talked about like uh, on other occasions about different things and um, like for example if you want to celebrate inclusion of diverse cultures and religions but then you don't organize any meetings that are coffee meetings or lunch meetings during the month of Ramadan when the Muslim members in your community are trying to fast because that's not fair <laughs> like there's nothing more unfair than sitting in front of someone eating a big slice of cake when they're on a diet or having to, to fast so to think about what interventions are doing so that they're reflective of what the community would want. That would be the big sort of take home that I would say. Um, the second thing that people can do is in a very nice way um, to speak up and not over. So don't speak for someone um, whose experience isn't yours. And this is something that I'm acutely aware of in all of my work, because as I said, I'm a, I'm a white, straight, cis woman. Um, and so... I work on transgender issues and intersex issues, and that is not my story. And so I'm always very careful to make sure when speaking about it that I'm not mm. speaking instead of a, a person from that community who can speak very well for themselves, or that what I'm doing when speaking is trying to open a door or create a platform rather than to take over and to grandstand. Um, and the, the image I always have in my head for this, which tells you about when I grew up, is take that, right? So if you think about take that, the podcast, <laughs> Um, the people who kind of come to your mind are the three lads who did the solos, right? Um, Gary, Robbie and Mark and the two other tools in the back who were just like harmonizing and being good dancers. Um, Jason and Howard. You want to be Howard. Jason has sod it off now and Howard is the last remaining background support guy in the band. You want to be a Howard standing there doing your best to make Mark and Gary look amazing. But it's their show, really, and you're the one supporting them. So you want to be a Howard. That's how you want to be a good ally, yeah. helping and supporting people. In terms of the intersex thing, Mel and I are working on this project funded by the Irish Research Council called Mapping the Lived Experience of Intersex in Ireland. And as we know, there's as many intersex people in Ireland as there are people living in Carlow. <laughs> so it turns out, and we know nothing about their stories. And so what we're doing with this project is trying to gather mm -hmm the stories of intersex people in Ireland 
so that there is a solid research base there to develop policies, guidelines and laws um, that are appropriate to help alleviate the trauma that I talked about. So we're having our big international conference on this next month. Um, the tickets have gone on general sale today. I'm going to put the link in the chat and being totally abused. Please do. Please do. Yeah. Um, and so they're, they're very reasonably priced um, and people are very welcome um, to come along and the lead yeah. academics and activists and advocates for intersex all around the world are going to be presenting at this. So it's a mixture of an academic conference and activist conference, but it's also a safe space because there's going to be a lot of intersex people who share their stories about what their lives are like and the challenges that they have faced. Um, so and so can I just disrupt you for one second? Learn. Can I just say to you, as a, as, as a person from Carlo, quite a number of us have actually <laughs> found the roads out of Carlo. So you'd want to re-examine re our population rate down there. Uh, <laughs> well, it's there based is, on the last census. But yeah, exactly. The next census is that there's next nobody year. would be saying they're from Carlo. But <laughs> can, I, I, can I just say, when you say about allyship, the one thing that, that can be done for inclusivity is, I remember going out to a nursing home and they were saying, well, how can we be inclusive? You could be inclusive by symbols. Mm. If you have symbols on the wall, like triangles, like I remember this nursing home, it was brilliant. They had this absolutely, mm -hmm. it was just fabulous what they had done on the walls. And I turned around and I said, here, throw in a, a, a rainbow uh, ball in there that the cat is playing with. You know, there's all the flags of Europe. I said, here, stick in a rainbow flag in the middle of it you know, because you have the European flag and then you have all the flags of Europe. So you stick in the rainbow. It's just symbol. Inclusion doesn't have to be in your face. It can be subtle. Those lovely little subtle yeah. inclusive images that you know you feel safe, that you know that this is a safe space, that you know that, you know, I, that you belong. The other thing which I, I, I really want to say is this all sounds able-bodied. You, to be inclusive of members of the community who are disabled. Mm -hmm. They too, they can feel far more excluded mm. than the able-bodied. The other thing is I'd like to get back to what Margot was talking about, and that's the symbolism really of in, in cultures where you cannot say who you are, is create the spaces where the symbols of exclusion, whether they're symbols of disability, whether they're symbols of ableness, whether they're symbols of deafness, it include all the symbols. And that just makes, creates a different way. Because if you just include the, the queer symbols, it, it's actually pointing towards something. So you have mm. to be careful between yeah. focusing on something and actually including something. So, you know, throw up the arrays, just put things in. You know, simple things, actually, I think, which really works. Um, doors don't have to be white, but we have this thing about white blooming doors, no matter where you go. In your corridors, have the, have the doors, but have them with the colour of pride. Start with the colours and work the whole way down. And there's your symbol of inclusion. It is not in your face. It is subtle. And those who understand, pick it up. Yeah, and, and Mel, just to, some of the companies I've worked for that, that their policy has very been has been, you know, no matter what environment we're operating in, when you're in our company and you're inside our doors, these are our values and this is how we do things. So I think that that's a really good point yeah. you make. So yeah, it's and it's subtle, you know, it's rather yeah. than shouting it, you know, because yeah, then and absolutely. there's a risk then of shouting it as well that you might be kind of exposing somebody, um, which is not good. Absolutely you know? subtle um, is good because because I'm really can't we could talk all day. <laughs> yeah, and Dermot, there was I had a question for you, and I know we're shifting now to something yeah, different. I but I had a, sport I, and pro, yeah, sport yeah, I had a question and, for you around you know sport without labels, right? Which is really really important. Important. Mm. And I know it's mm. something you're very passionate about and oh, your organization is very oh, passionate about. And um, would you talk to us just a little bit about that and, and your work in, in that space? Yeah, like, well, first of all, like, as I said, I'm an avid runner, absolutely. And I benefit so much from in going to an LGBT club. Absolutely brilliant for my mental health and accepting who I am. So that's it. equally when I'm going to the gay games with Philip Ryder who's listening here. And um, a group of us got together and started Sport and Pride. So the aim is to get our Ireland to be the most diverse sporting organization or sport field ever. That's gonna take a while, 
Yeah. You were asking how we're going to get there. Well, we start now. Even companies or people can reach out or whatever. For example, Athletics Ireland did an event right with us, you know, and talked about certain things. But how we're going to Aoife Cook was great with the GA players, everything else. So it's making more people who are identified as queer more visible. That is mm. what the rule, that is what we're doing. So at the moment, we do need the labels and stuff like that, but eventually we come to a stage when the person is a good runner, a good footballer, it doesn't matter if they're trans or whatever, that's what we're planning to do. So having these open discussions, like again, like today, like we're doing here, this is where we start. We talk, people ask, where do you start? Will you reach out to yeah. us here, all of us? Yeah. Reach out for advice, yeah. exactly. Where do I start? Simply yeah. as you start with the first question, like, you know, where yeah. do I go? Like, with sport and private plan, definitely where our goal is definitely to have a list, which we do, have a list of clubs who identify who are LGBT clubs. Because many people don't even know Dublin Front Runners exist, Cork Front Runners, country, yeah, yeah. <laughs> clubs around the country. So it's really, it's, we're a starting point, like people out there who are still, as I said, struggling, struggling. And sport is wonderful to have yeah. with your mental yeah. health. So yeah. it's a great uh, vehicle to have with sport and private. It's a list of clubs and somebody can go, there you go, okay, I'm gay. Yeah. What I want to do, yeah. so I'm not aware of it. It's open discussions, I say, starting yeah. here. Reaching yeah, and, and, and that's a great point you make is that where do you start, you know? And, and in fairness, that was our intention of today was, you know, yes. through the center, we're connected to all of you and, right. and you're all doing different things. And sometimes it's collaboration, mm -hmm. sometimes it's separate. But what we wanted to do was to bring this insight and this fantastic work and research that's yes. happening here to take it out, you know, and, and to try and, I suppose, equip the ERGs and the allies in the workplace with the yes. information they would need, with the connections they need. And, and, and just on that point, Tanya, so the, the research- you go, though, the, add to that, we're talking about people who work. We're not talking about people who are moving out of work. Hmm. So we do, the, we do need people to think about retirement. And yes. that's for a majority yes. of people in the community work was their identity yeah and once one. you leave work who are you yeah sorry i just no it was just it. just one thing to say because I, do, I don't want to miss um uh, something that for me is going to be extremely important which is the research project yes. that is happening on the back of the conference tanya yeah. and mel because i know yeah. for me i i see that as going to be the shift uh, and and that mm. that will start the conversation and i don't want that to be a missed opportunity so if there's people who for, for example who can't maybe make it to the uh, make it to um the conference it, will there be an opportunity for them to engage in the research that you're ta that's taking place at the moment yeah um so we we're open to and we're gathering stories from irish intersex people people with variations in their sex characteristics uh, people with disorders or divergences of sexual development whatever your preferred phrase is and um, we're gathering their stories and we're doing that in a number of different ways so we've a live online survey that's anonymous and um, it is very long um, and i know that and so we're very grateful to, yeah. to everyone who has filled it in but we're trying to understand the whole of people's lives so we don't just ask yeah. about medicine but we also ask ask about school and work and your personal life and um, so it's a quite a long survey so you can find that on our project website which is dcu.ie forward slash intersex you can get the link there to the survey also through that you can find out about our interviews so we're looking to speak with three types of people so um intersex people, their families, and the healthcare professionals who, who support them um, so, and treat them. So those are the, the groups of people we're looking to speak to. And so if you fall within one of those categories and you'd like to share your story with us so that um, we can help to build an understanding of intersex experience in Ireland, um, that would be wonderful. And we'd love to hear from you. So dcu.ie forward slash intersex. Thank you, Tanya. And Dermot, we've about 30 seconds left. How can people get in contact with Under the Rainbow and the fantastic work you're doing there? How can they get in contact with Sporting Pride? Yeah, we're under the rainbow is our website for Under the Rainbow. You can contact us directly there. And we have a website as well, sportingpride.ie. And we're, both organisations are all over social media, right? So you can see it's there. So reach out. Don't, it always starts. I can remember when I started my journey to reach out for help to accept who I was. Yeah. So that's where you start. So yeah. under the rainbow.e for help for talks and for therapy and sporting pride for yeah. sporting futures. Brilliant. Okay, I'm going to 
finish up now we could we could go on for we know we this um, <laughs> uh, and, and I have to say it's been very enjoyable that you're three fantastic uh, panelists so I was really looking forward to today and um, and and uh, I have enjoyed every minute of it and Thank can you. I say that it's the start of a conversation yes. okay so and that's what I'd like is that it is yeah. the start of a conversation feel free to reach out to us um, and, you know, if, if it is a case that we might do something again later in the year and follow on from the conference, we can do that. Um, so, Tanya, thank you. Mel, thank you. Great. It was You're a pleasure welcome. having you today. And Dermot, thank you. And uh, we look forward to speaking to you again soon. Thank you all. Thank you. Enjoy thank the you. rest of the day. <laughs>